Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, for those who missed yesterday's broadcast, we began reading and discussing a very important book, the title of which is very revealing, more to the title than meets the eye. The title of this book is The Global Vatican. <clears throat> the Global Vatican. For those of you who are, uh, for those of you with ears to hear and eyes to see, and who are looking for the origin or the birthplace of this global government that we now face, you have it. The Global Vatican. The Global Government. I think this author very shrewdly revealed a truth in the title of his book, The Global Vatican. This is written by a former U.S. ambassador to the, quote-unquote, the self-styled Holy See, uh, Ambassador Francis Rooney. And yesterday we read the, uh, the foreword of the book by former Ambassador John Negroponte, both of which are devout Roman Catholics and serve the papacy, not the United States of America. And this book reveals the extent to which, at least that which is publicly revealable, the extent to which the Vatican controls both foreign and domestic policy of the United States of America. A once Protestant nation, a, a nation that once protested the papacy, once protested the Antichrist of the Bible. And for those of you who have never heard, and many of you haven't, unless you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update, the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. It's an office. It's headed by a human entity called the papacy. And since an office really has no end with the decease of one pope, but continues pope after pope after pope. It's only through the papacy that the, that the uh, prophetic antichrist of the Bible can continue to persecute God's people for nearly 2,000 years. And so if you're looking for a single man, as you've been taught in your churches to expect as the Antichrist, you've been shrewdly deceived. The Protestant Reformation was based. Its foundation was laid on the premise, the fact, the biblical, historical, and prophetic fact that the papacy is the only entity on the world that can fulfill the role of Antichrist in the world. <clears throat> now, we're continuing in the prologue, and I'll retreat to the beginning of the paragraph that I concluded with the program yesterday for continuity purposes. But we're reading the prologue in this book, and uh, author Francis Rooney gives us an account of his official credentialing. Uh, by the quote-unquote Holy See, the papacy, he's having a, a, a direct personal uh, audience with the Pope. And uh, it's a formal assemblage uh, so that the papacy has a chance to formally accept this, this uh, ambassador from the United States. And uh, it's an initial meeting is what it is. It's very formal, and it follows strict papal protocol, and I'll begin by reading uh, the, the last paragraph on uh, the bottom of page 10 in the prologue, if you're following along in your own copy of the book, and I highly recommend you get a copy of this book. It's uh, published, let's see, who's the publisher? Roman Littlefield, Roman and Littlefield, The Global Vatican by Francis Rooney. <clears throat> now, with the text, it says, back to that October meeting in 2005, <clears throat> excuse me while I try to get rid of this frog, back to that October morning in 2005, Monsignor Caputo 
was officially inviting me to my first official public function as ambassador, the occasion when I would present my credentials to Pope Benedict XVI and receive in return his sanction and blessing. Credentialing is a highly ceremonial affair, but is also substantive. A rare private audience with the Pope, this would be an opportunity to make a positive first impression and articulate goals and objectives of the Bush administration, which might resonate with the Holy See. This would be one of the most important days of my term as ambassador, and a, remar and a remarkable mo uh, moment for our family. So it was inconceivable for us to meet the Pope without our children present. Our oldest son, Larry, was out of school and working at a new job in Chicago. His brother, Michael, and sister, Kathleen, were still in college. I'd sure like our children to come to this, said he, I said to Monsignor Caputo. Is there any chance that I could do it during Thanksgiving break? Unquote. The Monsignor gazed back at me blankly as if he did not quite understand what I was asking. Quote, if we moved it, I offered helpfully, they would have to miss, they wouldn't have to miss any classes, unquote. Should I have mentioned that Larry, My, uh, Michael, and Kathleen attended the University of Notre Dame, a leading Catholic university in the United States? I doubt it would have helped. Quote, I understand, Mr. Ambassador, said Monsignor Caputo after a very few uh, moments of quiet, but unfortunately, November 12th <clears throat> is the date which is available in the Holy Father's agenda, according to the prefecture for the papal household, unquote. The look in his eyes told me this would not be a discussion worth pursuing. That's right, when you go to visit the Vatican... You follow strict Vatican protocol, and nobody has the right to change the itinerary of the quote-unquote Holy Father. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords of this counterfeit Christian uh, society that they are bringing about in this, uh, in this world. So... Uh, Francis Rooney responds, right, got it, November 12th it is then, unquote. Lesson learned, a few days of classes would be missed. The professors at Notre Dame would probably understand. Obviously, since they are Roman Catholic professors at a Roman Catholic university, and they are also subservient to the papacy. Now, this book is written, says Rooney, in much the same spirit that I began serving at the U.S. Mission to the Holy See that autumn in 2005, a once hope, uh, at once hopeful to add value and to cap uh, capably represent President Bush and our country, but also humbly aware that there would be much to learn. What follows here is an effort to share what I have learned about the Holy See, particularly regarding its relationship with the United States during my service. Anyone who has served as ambassador to the Holy See would probably agree that this relationship is of vital importance to both America and the world. I want to read that again. Anyone who has served as ambassador to the Holy See would probably agree that this relationship, that is the relationship between the United States and the papacy, is, a, is of vital importance to both America and the world. So says Ambassador Rooney. The relationship between the United States and the Holy See is vitally important both to America and the world. There's a lot to that that would just simply escape and fly right over the top of your head, but it's an admission. 
anyone who has served as ambassador to the Holy See would probably agree that this relationship is of vital importance to both America and the world. Stop and think of what he just told you. The Vatican and the United States together have a joint world concern. That is the creation of a global government under the headship of the papacy. The United States government, the federal government of the United States, is simply using the wealth, power, influence, military might, power to economically sanction other nations that will not cooperate with this new government. Should the United States of America be, on your behalf, without your knowledge, surrendering the sovereignty of this once Protestant nation and not only subjecting us to the authority and direction and dictation of the Antichrist of Rome, but to use our resources, every available resource of this country, to conquer the rest of the world and bring them into subjection to this new world order. You think I've overstepped? Listen again. Anyone who has served as ambassador to the Holy See would probably agree that this relationship is of vital importance to both America and the world. He continues, he says, for me and our family, it was also an education. The term education calls to mind the great American historian Henry Adams and his classic, The Education of Henry Adams, which I first read as an undergraduate at Georgetown. Remember, Jesuit Georgetown University? At that Jesuit institution, he was given this book entitled The Education of Henry Adams, to be read. Now he says Adams went abroad at the start of a new century at a time when the world was changing rapidly under the tide of new inventions and the industrial revolution. As the author of another classic of American literature, Mont Saint Michel and Charters, and an accomplished medievalist, Adams believed that enduring truths can be just as sustaining and energizing as new discoveries. That times of great, in fact, only, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, at times of great change, in fact, only make it more important to maintain alignment with fundamental moral and cultural principles. How enduring truths and human values are applied in the world is a big part of the long story of the Holy See. Okay? How enduring truths and human values are applied in the world is a big part of the long story of the Holy See. So recognizing that the Holy See is the, uh, well, let's just say the repository, the world repository of enduring truths and human values. That's right. The office of the Antichrist, according to this author, is the storehouse of world of the world for enduring truths and human values. That puts it right up there with the position of God, doesn't it? That's what's acknowledged by this author throughout this entire book. The Vatican, one of the oldest, if not the oldest, human institution in the world today. Headed up by a man called the Holy Father and uh, running an organization that is touted as the storehouse of enduring truths and human values. 
Now, with all those credentials, you'd think that the Vatican was, uh, well, really a shoe-in for this global government, wouldn't it? That's because it is the head of this global government. And we're showing you from this book, from the author's mouth, a devout Roman Catholic and an ambassador to the United, from the United States to the Holy See, <clears throat> maintaining continual, open, direct interaction between the federal government of the United States and the Holy See, is acknowledging why the Holy See has a right a divine right to rule the world. Is that okay with you? Is it okay with you that the Vatican should dictate to our government what our foreign and domestic policies should be? Do you suppose there's any chance that this border that is so porous between the United States and all the Roman Catholic countries south of our border, Mexico, Central and South America, that border that, despite all protest from the Americas, from, from, from Americans, that they stop this hemorrhaging of a U.S. wealth going down to South and Central and South America, never considering the possibility that the only reason that border is open is because 90 and more percent of every living human being south of that border is Roman Catholic. Never considering the religious or the religio-political importance of having that border open. Do you suppose that that border is open despite all the protests of the American people who are literally oblivious to why it's really why it's open would anybody even consider that it's open because they are Roman Catholics and it's open because the Pope wants it open remember the Pope dictates foreign and domestic policy and that its relationship with the United States is vitally important both to Americans and the world You think I've gone a bridge too far? Keep listening. This author is going to make it readily apparent to anybody who cares to listen. He says, how enduring truths and human values are applied in the world is a big part of the long story of the Holy See. It is also one of the central themes of this book. Before we continue... The terms Vatican and Holy See require clarification. The Vatican City State is the physical place, the 109 acres of sovereign territory, where the Pope and the Curia reside. That is the government of the Roman Catholic Church. That's where the Pope and the Curia reside. And where St. Peter's Basilica, that's the church, and the Vatican Museums are located. The term is commonly used to refer to church leadership and actions, much as the term White House is used to denote the executive branch of the United States government, or Washington to denote the entire U.S. government. In fact, the governing body of the Catholic Church is the Holy See, not the Vatican. The Holy See enters into diplomatic treaties and exerts influence in world affairs as described in this book. So he's telling us that in this book we are going to see described how the Holy See enters into diplomatic treaties with the nations of the world and exerts its influence in world affairs. The author is preparing you for the information that you're about to get. And it's not reported on the mainstream media or even in the alternative media. 
again, this is a very important book for those who are trying to discover why we are losing our rights, why it doesn't seem that our government, our federal government, is responsive to the will and the needs of the American people and is acting more like a dictator rather than a representative Republican form of government? The answer is simple. It's right here in this book. The people of this country no longer are the government. The government has separated itself from the people and now answers to a higher authority. And that's what this book is about. The Holy See enters into diplomatic treaties and exerts influence in world affairs as described in this book. For simplicity's sake, and in accordance with common usage, the terms Vatican and Holy See will be used more or less interchangeably here, but the distinction has important implications to be discussed in future pages. Now, part two of the prologue, the author writes, The morning of the credentialing brought perfect autumn weather to Rome. Kathleen and I had been in town for about a month, I had settled into my work at the embassy as Kathleen joined me in an almost nightly routine of diplomatic events. Our daughter and two sons had arrived from the States a day earlier, joined by my aunt from Pensacola, Florida, and my mother, and in parentheses he includes my father had passed away in 1980, to make the Villa Richardson a real home for our family. Everyone rose early that Saturday, filling the rooms with family voices and subdued excitement. Preparing for the credentialing visit to the Vatican was a simple matter for the women. Listen carefully. All black, head to toe, veil to shoes. Okay? Women, and for that matter, men, are to be dressed in black. If you're a regular listener, this will be repetitious for you, but... Black to the papacy, which is papal protocol, any visitors to the Vatican must dress in black. Okay, Black represents subservience, contrition, honor to the Pope. The papacy dictates how one should appear before him. All black, head to toe. Veil to shoes. That's right. Women have to wear black veils over their faces. He continues, but more complicated for me since Holy See protocol requires use of the quote-unquote frac, F-R-A-C, a white tie outfit with black vest. Once we were prepared, we gathered in the front hall at the bottom of the stairs. We were soon joined by staff members from the embassy. A fleet of black Mercedes sent by the Vatican pulled into formation in the Porta Corcieri. Along with the cars came several gentlemen of His Holiness, high-level officials dispatched by the Vatican to escort us to the Pope. And in parentheses he says, there are established protocols in all countries for credentialing, but the Vatican is especially attentive to these. And and uh, close parentheses. Now he says, I entered the front car with one of the gentlemen. <phone rings> Kathleen accompanied her own gentleman, following in the second Mercedes, as the rest of the family piled into a third. The embassy staff brought up the rear. In a convoy, we took off for Vatican City, led by a squadron of leather-clad motorcycle police, the Stradali and the usual armed guards in back. We'll continue with our reading and discussion of the book The Global Vatican by former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney. You'll have an eye-opener before this is over. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update, and if you'd like to contact the host, please do so by email. Uh, my email address is tom at seawaves.us. Tom at S E A W A V E S. If you have questions or comments, I'd be very happy to uh, 
help you if you have concerns of any kind. If you have suggesting, su- suggestions for a book that you'd like to hear read and discussed here on Inquisition Update, please avail yourselves of the opportunity. And it's my pleasure to serve, and I, I answer email that require an answer. If your email goes unanswered, it's because it didn't require one. <laughs> now, we'll get back to the reading of the prologue of this book by Francis Rooney, former U.S. ambassador to the quote-unquote Holy See. It gags me every time I say Holy See. There's nothing holy about it. It's the seat of the Antichrist of the Bible. And to call it Holy See is blasphemy, but that's what they call it. It's not holy to me, trust me. He continues his narration of his uh, moving from the ambassador residence to, uh, to the Vatican to meet the Pope. He says, descending from the top of Janiculum Hill, we passed a statue of Garibaldi, marking the site of the Italian Revolutionary's 1849 battle against French troops who fought on behalf of Pope Pius IX. Now, let let me explain the significance of this and why he included it. As a result of the Protestant Reformation, when most of Europe recognized the biblical description of the Antichrist as pertaining to the Pope and the papacy, they rebelled and protested against the papacy and would no longer regard him as their spiritual or temporal leader, as did most of Europe at that time. And not only would they no longer regard him as the representative of Christ, but he would be the Antichrist in their minds, the one to be shunned as was Judas. And to make the point perfectly clear, they not only repudiated the papacy, they repudiated Roman Catholicism and all of its bloodlust, all of its covetousness, and riotousness, and perversion, and extortion, and tyranny. And since the Pope was the one who seated all the kings of Europe, or at least required all the kings of Europe to be subservient to him and to do his bidding in their respective nations, they overtook to overthrow those governments and to install their own republican form of government. See, they recognized that the that the Vatican or the Holy See or the Pope was not the vessel of the Holy Spirit, but it was the people. That true Christ's righteousness would be seen in every individual and that they would have the power through the scriptures, through the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit, To live a life of righteousness, they did not need a pope or a priest anymore. And neither did they need a temporal ruler that did the pope's bidding and imposed upon them papal tyranny. They coveted the freedom whereby Christ had made them free. They overthrew their governments and established their own republican form of governments where the people became the government and the governments were the servants of the people. That was the model that was followed by the colonial period in this country. Now, subsequently, Rome got control of our government, but at the time, the United States was really a model for the rest of the world. It put in place Republican and Protestant principles. Liberty. Now, Roman Catholic Italy, right there in the shadows of the Vatican walls, decided that they no longer wanted the Pope as their temporal ruler. Oh, he could remain the Holy Father, but they didn't want him 
meddling in their governmental affairs. He was a tyrant. And he built the people of all their money. And so General Garibaldi led a Republican overthrow of the papal tyranny in Roman Catholic Italy. You see, even Roman Catholics love liberty. Even the Roman Catholics in this country love liberty. That's why they're so inconsistent uh, with the uh, Roman Catholic uh, canon law, choosing to do as their heart dictates rather than to do what the papacy says. <clears throat> That's why there's so much discord between the quote-unquote Holy Father and American Roman Catholics. Because they've lived in a Protestant land. They've seen their Protestant neighbors live independently and quite well without that papal tyranny. Italy wanted to follow the same suit. Roman Catholic Italy overthrew the Pope's temporal power and installed their own Republican form of government. Even Catholics understand the importance of handling their own affairs without the intermeddling of the papal power. I, I wonder how many Roman Catholics in Italy did as was forbidden by the papacy and began to read Bibles written in their own languages, Protestant Bibles. But nonetheless, Italy overthrew the tyranny of the papacy, and Garibaldi led that overthrow in 1849. And as a result, Pope Pius IX, this very pope that saw the overthrow of his government in over Italy in 1864, wrote the Syllabus of Error. And in that lengthy condemnation is all it can be described as he attacked every Republican form of government and he specifically pointed toward the republic that was established here in the United States of America. He knew that Italy rebelled against his tyranny because of the example of once Protestant USA. Italy wanted to follow our example, our Protestant example. And so it's very significant in the history of the papacy and in the history of Italy, this 1849 revolutionary battle against the papacy. And the Pope relied on Roman Catholic France to come against Italy and to defend the Pope's tyranny. And Garibaldi uh, was powerful enough to stave off the French uh, attempt to restore papal power over Italy. And Italy became a republic. Roman Catholic, though it may be, it became a republic. So it was a protest against the tyranny, the temporal power of the Pope. It was successful, and it remains successful today. And isn't it extraordinary? that the very example that Italy followed, the United States of America, has now become the most important ally to the Holy See. The United States of America, once Protestant, once protested the Pope, established a government that would never allow a foreign dictator to, di to dictate to the American people either foreign policy or domestic policy has now accomplished that goal. While Italy, right there in the shadows of the Vatican walls, became a republic, the United States has become, uh, let me just say, the American government has become Roman Catholic and a servant of the papacy, a global servant, a global military force serving the papacy. As unlikely as that sounds, if you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update, we've, we've proved it over and over and over and over again. And those who don't understand what this new world order is is simply because they're not listening to Inquisition Update. They're listening to Alex Jones. 
who would never point the finger at the Vatican. You have to ask yourself, why? Is Alex Jones really interested in preserving our Protestant Republic? If so, why does he not point out the great enemy of Protestant republics? Why does he not point out the papacy? It's a good question. I think everyone should ask the question. He says, Descending from the top of the Janiculum Hill, we passed a statue of Garibaldi marking the site of the Italian Revolutionaries' 1849 battle against French troops who fought on behalf of Pope Pius IX. Looking to the east, beyond the steeple of San Pietro in Montorio, where, in parentheses, the author adds, where St. Peter was crucified, and if you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update, you know St. Peter never set foot in Rome. He was the apostle to the circumcised, to the Jews, and he kept his ministry among the Jews Paul, whose ministry included Rome and, st and started a church in Rome, never once mentions Peter having been in Rome in all of his epistles. The simple fact of the matter is, Peter, the apostle, never set foot in Rome. He could not have been crucified in Rome, whether upside down or right side up, and we have to ask, who was that Peter that was crucified upside down in Rome? And if you're a regular listener, you know that it was uh, Simon, Peter, Simon, Peter, Simon the Sorcerer, Simon the Magi of Acts chapter 8, not the Apostle Peter. Simon Magus, the, Sim the Simoniac, and he set the tone for the Roman Catholic Church. Simony. religious favor for the, a price, the selling of ecclesiastical favor for money, indulgences. That's the very character of that church, because it was started by a Simoniac, the Simoniac, Simon Magus. Now he continues... He says, looking to the east beyond the steeple of San Pietro and Montorio, where St. Peter was crucified, he says, and across the Tiber, I could see the domes and bell towers of central Rome, a city that had been ruled by popes, saved by popes from barbarian plunder, and occasionally sent popes fleeing into exile. There's almost no place you can go in Rome without encountering the 2,000-year history of the papacy, and we were about to visit the most extraordinary place of them all. Speaking of the, the uh, St. Peter's Basilica. Now, two distinct thoughts ran through my head as we sped north along the Tiber toward Vatican City. The first concerned the incredible fact that we were on our way to meet the Pope. Humbling beyond description for someone from rural Oklahoma a state where Catholics comprise a mere 3% of the population. Now, let me stop and add a comment here. If you're looking for a Protestant state to relocate to, to get rid of the Catholic influence, don't look to Oklahoma, because it's loaded with ecumenical evangelical bellies that are essentially Catholic in their belief. Lutheran. They've repudiated the Protestant Reformation. They believe in a future single individual as an Antichrist who hasn't yet come, and we don't need to be worried about him or concerned about him, is a better term. And the Pope is just uh, the leader of the Christian world. As a matter of fact, the Lutherans, many of the, many of the uh, different divisions of the Lutheran Church believe that uh, in the real present of the real presence, the bodily presence of Jesus in the communion bread. Now, they stop just short of calling it a sacrifice like the Roman Catholic Church does, but they believe in the real presence 
that that is Jesus turned into bread to be eaten. Okay? That's about as Catholic as you can get without putting a sign on the door. So, a mere three percentage points of the population of Oklahoma are uh, Roman Catholic does not make Oklahoma a refuge for Protestants. We first have to destroy futurism and that phony Jesuit belief that the Antichrist is a single individual and restore true Protestantism in this once Protestant country. And that's one of the main goals of Inquisition Update, to wake up God's people to the deception that has literally destroyed Protestantism in this country and allowed this New World Order, this ecumenical movement, to take fruition. It can't be stopped until Protestant wisdom is restored. Now, he says, the other thought was that I had been given an important mission and intended to successfully accomplish what the government and the president expected of me. No mention of the people, right? Did you notice that? He intended to fully accomplish what the U.S. government, which is Roman Catholic, and the president, one of the Pope's servants, you know he seats the kings of the earth, the Bible is telling the truth, expected of me no mention of the american people because if the american people would speak up they would rather that no foreign potentate much rather the 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 head of the roman catholic church to dictate foreign or domestic policy to this country okay if common sense prevailed if historical biblical and prophetic sense prevailed in this country we would especially protest that the Pope would have any say either in foreign or domestic policy or any policy whatsoever in this country. But this fall, His Holiness is going to come and speak directly to your federal government. And you ought to know about it. And you ought to protest it. He says, on my lap in an envelope was a prepared statement which I would hand to Pope Benedict XVI when we met, just as he would deliver one to me. This meeting was an opportunity for me to move beyond the formal statement, though, and establish a basis for an open, expansive, and productive dialogue with the Holy See. And just... Every time I read the words Holy See, I want you to think Antichrist. Because that's what it means. Okay? This meeting was an opportunity for me to move beyond the formal statement, though, and establish a basis for an open, expansive, and productive dialogue with the Antichrist. Oh, now, Tom, you've gone too far this time. No, I haven't. I'm calling it what it is. And calling it by any other name is deception. It's a lie. Now, I'll read this book. But I'm going to remind you from time to time. This is the office of the Antichrist of the Bible that we're talking about. The papal power, the Antichrist power, the Holy See, is the seat of Satan in the world. <clears throat> now he says this papal audience, more generally, <clears throat> the timing of my assignment to the Holy See came at an important moment in history for both the United States and the Catholic Church. America was four years out from 9-11 and locked in difficult wars in two countries, including a conflict in Iraq, of which the Holy See had, strong and, had strongly and vocally disapproved. Now, it's just simply amazing that 
this author would mention 9-11 because I believe 9-11 was an inside job by our Roman Catholic government to justify a holy Roman crusade against recalcitrant nations in the Middle East. Nations that were not likely to be compatible unless changed from the inside or from the outside, as in the case of war, changed from being recalcitrant nations, nations not likely to be compatible or cooperative with a new global government, but must be made to conform. Iraq and Afghanistan and all of the Middle East is going to be forced by the United States of America primarily and its allies in the papal concern for a global or new world order to overthrow those nations. Regime change. That's the word they use to describe it. Regime change. Iraq isn't cooperating. Afghanistan isn't cooperating. They are vitally important to the global efforts of the United States and the Vatican jointly. And there had to become a justification for the overthrow of those regimes. Regime change. We had two dinosaurs standing tall in Manhattan. No way of safely and affordably getting rid of them, so they simply blew them up and blamed it on Saddam Hussein and Afghanistan, and we went to war. The American people, loving war, knowing our economy was dependent upon war efforts, the economy had been sagging, people were afraid for their, well, for their futures, got right on board this Holy Roman Crusade. And we shot up a bunch of innocent people. As a matter of fact, people that we probably, as a nation, should have been following their example in rejection of the Pope's New World Order. Now, you can say what you want about Saddam Hussein. He was no altar boy. <laughs> and neither was the government of Iraq, or uh, rather Afghanistan. And neither is the government of Iran. Or the government of Syria. But what the American people are never told is that those governments are not willing to submit themselves to a foreign global government. They're not willing to give up their national sovereignty and their way of life and their belief systems, their moralities, and kowtow to a quote-unquote Christian world, and it's not Christian at all. It's papal. And I want my listeners to know that there is a 180 degree difference between Christianity and Roman Catholicism. Christianity is the servant, is the service of Jesus Christ. It's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's a real kingdom. We have a king, we have a kingdom, and we have a constitution called the Bible. And then there is a counterfeit. It, too, is a real kingdom, but it is a physical kingdom headed up by the papacy and all of his allies. The United States of America being the foremost. It's a hideous reality, but unless we accept this reality and start beginning to recognize our federal government for what it is, we will never understand what our government is doing in this country and around the world. And we will never know for whom it is designed to benefit. And it is not designed to benefit the American people and particularly not used to des not designed to benefit God's people those of that heavenly kingdom that is in direct contradistinction to this diabolical, papal, earthly kingdom, this counterfeit kingdom they dare to call Christianity. 
It's time to wake up. It's time to protest. It's time to pray and ask God's assistance, but only after we repent of futurism. I'll see you tomorrow on the Inquisition Update.